uh, at this moment, we're actually going to have our conversation with La Doctora Ana Ofelia Rodriguez and Professor Anthony Stevens Acevedo. We brought them together uh, to have a conversation here as part of La Biennale de Venezia. Como viviremos juntos? How will we live together? And the first question that we will ask both are, cuando escuchas como viviremos juntos, que piensas? When you hear the phrase, how will we live together? How do we live together? What do you think of? Uh, for me, it's a very loaded question uh, because I don't know who I'm supposed to be addressing that is close to me, that will live close to me and together with me. Vivir juntos, to me, is really something I have to think seriously about because I feel that although I'm part of a community that I have served for the past 40 years, sometimes I find myself alien to that community. Uh, and because of all the issues with identity, no matter how hard I strive to make myself identify myself as a Dominican, I tend to find people on a daily basis that always question, are you really Dominican? You don't look Dominican. Why don't I look Dominican? Because you look like Afro-Americana. What are they saying? And I always ask the question, aren't there people that look like me that live in the Dominican Republic? Why I always get this question? Porque tú no pareces dominicana. And I gather from this conversation with various people and at all levels is that people like me don't exist in the Dominican Republic, people of my color. Not Ophelia, the person that could go and do an installation of multiple pieces of art throughout the city, throughout the world. Not an Ophelia that could have a conversation with young children as to what their future should look like. They're looking at Ophelia, this black woman that should not be representing Dominican Republic. I worry about it because very recently I've seen myself in all these scenarios in Washington Heights particularly. And what I could always reflect back to when I came to the United States, my family came to Brooklyn. My family came to Bushwick. And in Bushwick, we were like borderline with Best Buy. There were no programs for children that didn't speak English. I was already an adult because I came to go to college. I came at 17 and I had already finished high school. But my little nieces and nephews spoke no English. So they had to assimilate rapidly because they were not English speakers and they were Spanish in a community where folks never saw Spanish children of their color. So when they went to school, there was no bilingual education at the time. I'm talking about 1965, there was no bilingual ed. So these children rapidly assimilated into the Anglo culture because they had to, to survive. And my family saw, I saw my family surrounded only by African-American or Afro-Caribbean. And when I went to, when I went to school, when I finally went to the university, the first person that I met was someone from the island of Trinidad that received me. I, there were other Dominicans, they never got close to me, but I remember that this woman, Alison from Trinidad and I became best friends and a young man from Tunisia. But the Dominicans always like step aside because they were all a uh, shade lighter than I and you don't want to be with somebody blacker than you. Oh, that's the way I interpreted them. But through the years, after certain accomplishment, I began to, through Anthony, I met Anthony, not in San Pedro Macorís, because he's much younger than I. 
I met Anthony walking the streets of Seville in the University of Seville. And I saw this young man and I said, he looks Dominican. But we were in different facultades. Yo estaba en la Facultad de Letras, él estaba en la Facultad de Historia. And those groups didn't really meet up, although we were in the same building, but they were separated. And through some young Dominican lunatics that came to Sevilla, uh, you remember Onisha Roberto. One day I ran into these two young men in the post office and they told me, tú no eres de aquí. Of course, yo no era de allá, yo era una negra en Sevilla. And se me pararon, they stood behind me in the post office and one said, girl, talk to me, you don't want to talk to me. But I didn't talk to strange men and I saw these guys are looking like a little cuckoo. But they were very warm. And one of them said, listen, we're going to have a party in two days. And uh, we're going to assemble all the Dominicans together. And I want you to come. And I said, OK. So I showed up at the party. And who was there? This young man that I saw in many occasions walking through the university, but on the opposite side of me. And that was Anthony. And from then, we developed this friendship. And when we separated, I came to New York. He came to New York later on. But we didn't know where we were. We never got in touch with each other. And one day, and I'm bringing all this up because that's how I wound up in Washington Heights because of Anthony. I was a Brooklyn girl doing everything in Brooklyn. So I took a bus on Fifth Avenue, I remember one day, and it crossed 42nd Street. And who was crossing the street? Anthony. I jumped off that bus, ran, and there I found my soulmate, my little brother, like I used to call him. And through Anthony, I be, was introduced to Washington Heights. And he really brought me in the Dominicanness the reason for being Dominican and for God in each other and having a conversation with each other as to who we are and what we're doing in this huge metropolis and what the contribution could be. So that's where my world started working in the Dominican community and it was through Anthony Stevens. So that casual meeting, I am on a bus and he's crossing the street and I jump off the bus and we became los hermanitos de siempre. And we got into a lot of trouble together, but we stayed together. And we, I tried to follow him by his example of building communities. So when he asked me, you have to come to Washington Heights, we have all these things. We had a lot of mishaps because we tried to target the community in one way and it didn't work, but we finally found the niche. And then niche came through the Dominican Studies Institute trying to build itself. When we met, it was, uh, the Dominican Studies Institute was still a very, estaba naciendo, todavía no estaba bien formado. Y de ahí, from there, we had among the group of people that were in the dialogue or the discourse about the creation of this institute, Guillermo Linares was one of them. And I remember one day Ramona called the meeting and it was in Washington Heights. And at the end of the meeting, and this is in 1990, Guillermo said something crazy like, well, I came today because I plan to resign to run for office. And we all look at each other like, he's nuts. A man so soft spoken is going to run for office. Well, he did. And to my dismay, I was sitting one day in my office. At that time, I had a fancy job on Park Avenue and Bankers Trust. I was on a 33rd floor, trying to be a yuppie, which I wasn't. But I, was, I had aspiration to be a yuppie. Anthony called me to a meeting with Guillermo. And he told me he's Guillermo's campaign manager and that he needed my help. I said, help how? And I went up to give him a hand and I got stuck because then we saw that it, the Dominican community was really in crisis. 
we couldn't stop to think about whether I'm accepted because of my race or not, whether these people understand that we are all are brothers and sisters. What we knew that there was a serious problem with drug infiltration, serious assassinations that were taking place and that the community was in turmoil. And it was one of the youngest community. I don't remember the statistic, but at that time, one, Washington Heights had the, it was the youngest community in Asia of the city of New York. And Anthony believed that we had to save the youth. And the only way we could do it was entering into political dialogue. And that's how it all became. It all began for me. So Anthony could follow up on this. Very interesting. Um, made me remember a number of things. Um, uh, in, a, in a way, um, I had a, a kind of a somewhat similar experience uh, as Ophelia overall described in terms of uh, you uh, having a sense of uh, who you are ethnically or how you connect to one particular population or people and still uh, feeling here and there, probably Ophelia's experience was uh, harsher than or, or, or more intense than mine in that regard. But I, I, I also, I can easily empathize with what Ophelia described uh, in terms of you, in, my, in this case, me identifying myself as Dominican because I was raised uh, a kind of similar case of the Ophelia until I was 16 in uh, the Dominican Republic with the difference that, and I, you know, going to the biography, which is a factor here, you know, actually, I was born to uh, a garment industry, Dominican immigrant woman worker here in the United States. So I was born here, I was sent to the Dominican Republic when I was two years of age, but I grew up there until I was 16. So basically 99.9 .9 of uh, my memories in terms of uh, roots are connected to the Dominican Republic. So that's why I primarily define myself as a Dominican person. And so I felt when uh, I came back to New York uh, as an adult. Uh, but after having a long experience of residing in Spain. So that had introduced in my life a number of experiences, including the accent uh, in my way of speaking Spanish at the time, after nine years residing in Spain, which uh, became an issue sometimes when I tried to insert myself in the Dominican community here in New York City. Again, my hometown, but a place where I haven't lived since I was two years of age. Uh, so actually, I, I don't think I have any clear memory of my first two years here. Uh, there's there's an instance where I think I remember some, some kind of a place, but I'm not sure. The thing is, I came as an adult uh, with a sense of being Dominican, trying to uh, connect with the Dominican community in New York City. And uh, I, I learned uh, at the time what it meant for people to uh, ask you, are you really Dominican? Well, once, once you told them because of my accent. And then I also discovered that I had, because I left the DR so early, I had also missed or disconnected myself from some other experiences beyond uh, the, um, the speech thing, uh, beyond, beyond the, the way you talk, like, 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 uh, what uh, foods you prefer uh, and like. Um, I, uh, I learned how to eat uh, avocados when I was in, back in New York. So imagine until 16, living in the DR and uh, everybody would eat avocados around me all the time. And I said, that thing, I don't like it, you know, so I don't like avocados. So <laughs> when, when uh, my fellow Dominicans uh, saw me, I heard me speaking the way I used to, sp uh, to speak, and then on top, when when it came to sit down to eat together, you know, they would see that I wouldn't like to eat avocados. You know, it was like, what? You know, okay, so you say you're Dominican. Then you speak this funny way, you know, that doesn't, every now and then you say a Dominican word, but you know, not, not often. Now you tell me that you don't eat avocados? Come on, you have not, you have never, um, you, you don't like chivo? You know, uh, and I said, no, I don't like, I don't like goat, you know, um, and these are just very concrete things, but I could go into, you know, 
uh, attitudes, behaviors, um, gender relations in terms of uh, how women and men relate, especially when they meet for the first time in, in certain Dominican, in certain sectors of Dominican culture, and so on and so forth. I, I hear the, the, uh, Ophelia very clearly when she says how how, how um, reconnecting with uh, a large Dominican community like the, the one in the New York diaspora can be a challenge for Dominicans that do not fit the sometimes oh. too rigid um, definition of what Dominicanness is. Yes. And actually, for many of us, that theme of what does it mean to be Dominican and what it implies became. Uh, a, 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 a theme of reflection and conversation for probably since ever, ever, ever since, since then, okay, until today. Um, but I also wanted to uh, go back to, even if, if we can go back to these more biographical experiences things, I could, I, I want to go back to the uh, uh, question that Nelson was posing in terms of, uh, you know, uh, what do we understand uh, in terms of living together? So we, we have given you a very personal aspect to it. If, if you go more in, in the conceptual aspect or, or theoretical, if you want, I would say that the way I, the way I see uh, uh, vivir juntos uh, as, as coexistence, to me, um, as, as so many other things in life, has become something very political. At least that's the way I see it. I mean, that's that's what I think. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, you know, in, in a world that is becoming more and more, and this is a cliche already, but there's a lot of truth to it, more and more globalized. You see, I I tend to think uh, I, I I I tend to swing or switch between thinking about what happens to me on a daily basis versus what happens to some people in other countries that I m might know of, or people residing in other countries that I might imagine what they go through. You know, it's it's like the same um, thinking process and reflecting. And uh, you know, to me, coexistence, vivir juntos, nowadays implies things like dignity. Uh, that is the notion of dignity. And how we promote it? How do we uh, protect it? How uh, do we uh, practice it? Uh, it entails uh, the notion of social justice, mm -hmm. uh, equity, um, equal uh, equal access to opportunities, um, fighting against all sorts of privileges. You know, to me, that that privilege is like. Uh, a kind of uh, devilish presence in society, you know, uh, something I really abhor, and uh, uh, that to me is, is something to be constantly dealt with, uh, not one day, not in a conference, not with one law, but in civic daily life. It's part of our struggle, like breathing, you know, uh, fighting privilege, uh, because it's a, uh, it's, it's an old heritage historically, so it's like our societies have tried to overcome privilege through laws, through certain new values. Uh, obviously, you know the, the the value notion of human equality, human rights, uh, a, 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 a legacy from the French Revolution, you know, égalité, fraternité, da da da. But uh, it's like underneath that, we are always uh, uh, tempted to go into privilege. So it's something that uh, it's like selfishness, you know, you you always have to be on guard. And mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of not allowing others to incur in, priv in privilege, as well as uh, um, um, kind of um, uh, looking at yourself and keeping uh, some kind of self control as to the tempt your temptation to exercise privilege against others or at the expense of others. So. Vivir juntos to me today, and it, it entails all that, and not only within your own ethnicity, uh, or I would say the other way around, because we, we tend to we tend to look and demand equality and uh, 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 rights 
versus other communities or or, or, or people that we identify as other, different, different than mm -hmm. us, as if within our own ethnicity and society and even families, okay, uh, there is not there's no no inequality, and no, it's it's uh, it's it's as pervasive within as with as outside. So for me, uh, the, the 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 notion of uh, vivir juntos is a constant struggle, uh, twenty four seven. Uh, yep. uh, 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 um, uh, 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 24-7, you know, and 16 mm -hmm. minutes uh, an hour. Um, yeah. And um, uh, I, I think is is the only, for me, it's the only way to to imagine what Vivir Juntos means because I can't, I can't imagine or accept morally, you know, any notion of people being together without exercising nowadays an effort because again it's an ideal you you mm -hmm. try right an effort to achieve uh, equality respect tolerance mm -hmm. you know uh, that's what what it means to me and i don't care again whether you're talking about among dominicans or between dominicans mm -hmm. and others i could i could i could address either because yeah. what ophelia was sharing before mm -hmm. had a lot to do with uh, uh vivir juntos within and mm -hmm. uh, and we can also refer to uh, which Ophelia also alluded to the struggles of Dominicans to be uh, as a collective to mm -hmm. be accepted in this society in terms of uh, vivir, vivir juntos with others. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. We we want to be accepted and included in 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 both areas within and outside. Yeah. Uh, Anthony and Ophelia, thank you so much. I think that. You both, um, thank you for sharing your stories and you both uh, bring to the table the role that identity, that color uh, plays in our interaction with the various spaces, including our own communities, our own families. Uh, mm -hmm. So we really appreciate um, your contribution to this conversation by your personal story. So how do you, uh, each of you think that we can expand those spaces. I think you both hit the, you know, you answered the question of moments that you felt included or not excluded or not included um, by your, you know, for different reasons uh, in your own communities, in, in, in different spaces. So how do we expand those spaces to be more inclusive? It requires a lot of work and it requires the participation, the conscious participation of those of us that in academia, uh, when we speak into our students about identity, nationality, how the confusion becomes that you confuse nationality with identity. I am one of those people that I find myself very reluctant sometimes to say I'm Dominican because I was always labeled Coca-Cola and it was pejorative. It's still pejorative to me. And I come from a culture in the Kokolo culture where I know that my people came to work in the sugar plantations, but they brought a whole component of a new socialization type of life. They brought their doctors, they brought their teachers, they brought their lawyers. And they brought the sharecroppers that had to cut the cane. But it was a community built on pride, on delivering to the community in which they lived, enriching that community. But so often we will hear the bloods coming down, and un cocol, una cocolita, and it still prevails today. And although the term Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola have become generalized and everybody's using it, even I now will identify myself como una Coca-Cola, which I know when I was growing up, when they call you Coca-Cola, they were calling you dirt. Because I heard too many times the expression Coca-Cola de mierda. And as a child, I always associated that, like, are we this? And no matter how we live, but there were two groups of Coca-Cola. There were those cocolos that came very fair complexion. 
And those Cocolos had privileges that the dark complexion Cocolos didn't have. So this is something that's embedded in the Dominican culture, that if you're light skin, you're no longer Cocolo. Nobody's gonna call you Cocola, Dominicana. I have cousins that are Dominicanos, but those are not like my mother's group. My mother was very Africanoid. My father was a mixed Cocolo, but his family were not Cocolo. They were Dominican. My mother and her tr tribe, we were Cocolos, except two of my sisters that were light complexion. Nobody would call them Cocolo. And uh, growing up in a country where there was this outright resistance to accept a child born in that country as being a native of that country, you grow up and you go, you travel abroad and you find that you more easily accepted by those that don't know this history of Cocolo versus Dominican versus Haitian and they accept you for who you are not the baggage that you're bringing with you. So although I am at an age where I'm retired now and I really have tried to give to the Dominican community here and in Dominican Republic the most I could give, I still carry this weight on my shoulders. Who am I? Because sometimes I feel I'm being used. And at the end of the day, people only seeing una cocola. So the thing about equality for me never existed. And even though I have worked and I still work with the Dominican community, I know that uh, if I tell you, I don't feel that sometimes the reception I get, that the spaces in which I'm navigating are really receptive to me or treat me equal I would be lying to you if I tell you that I really feel that I've been accepted all the time. Because at the end of the day, this now La Cocola is going to come out. La Cocola el Cocolo, not Ofelia la Negra Dominicana. And I am una Negra Dominicana. I don't know of any country called Cocolo land. I don't know any other place that appears on my birth certificate saying I am from there, but it says Dominican Republic, that I was born in San Pedro and I call it Dominican Republic. And I have a right to claim that. But others have disclaimers. She may have been born there, but she's not one of us. And there's no social justice. And we have to bring that up to our people. Very recently, I look, I, I have this great admiration for Lee Manuel Miranda and what he has done. And I, when I saw the preview in the height, I said, oops, nobody looks like me. But I kept it to myself. But because I know that's not his intention. I know that family, well, that was not their intention. And when the criticism came out two weeks ago after the Tribeca, I said, oh my God, I should have called his father and tell him that this is how I felt that day and that somebody else might make mention of it. And I feel bad that I kept silence, but I didn't think it was my place that it was appropriate for me. But other people saw it and did the same analysis that I did. And it's a great piece, should be shown throughout the world but it's the same Dominican community, not the people that selected the stars for this show, for this picture. Our own people are the ones that are designating whose color should be portrayed as Dominican. So colorism is alive and well in our community. Todo el mundo quiere ser rubio. All these black with dark complexion women dyeing their hair blonde straightening them to death because they don't want to be who they are. They don't want to be identified with the appropriate race with which they came. They came to this earth. You came to this earth being black, but well, black it is. 
and be proud. And I am one that in my later years, I have been very close to working with some of the Garveyites that have been soldiers for Carlos Cooks and uh, even among the people, Dominicans that are hearing now about Carlos Cooks don't understand the phenomenon. This family had to leave Dominican Republic because they were going to be assassinated because they preach about blackness, about the connection that we have with Africa. That's what Garveyism is about, about becoming socially accepted, but we could only become socially accepted if we have economic independence. And that caused that family to be called betrayed, to be called like betrayers of the Dominican culture. And they had to go into exile. And where did Dr. Cook deposited his son? In Harlem. So he could follow and continue the preachings of Marcus Garvey. And from the mouth of a young child growing up in Dominican Republic, although he was only there for 17 years of his life, came out the biggest slogan in American history. Black is beautiful. By a Dominican child. But see, our parents and grandparents kept telling us this. You are beautiful. You are one of us. And Today, I still find so many of us that cannot say I am black, I am proud of being a black Dominican. Like we heard one of the candidates in the recent mayoral campaign, Diane Morales, she will only identify herself as a black Boricua, black Puerto Rican. Very few Dominicans do that. I've never seen a Dominican candidate in New York City say I'm black. Nobody. The closest one that has come to that is Antonio Reynoso in Brooklyn. But we have this fear of saying I'm black, I'm proud. I'm proud of my history, I'm proud of my people, I'm proud of being a black Dominican. In, and, in Australia, if I may. So what, what I hear you saying is, you know, that there's education that needs to happen. So we need to educate yes. uh, some of this history that many of us have not learned in schools or at home for that matter. Mm -hmm. No, you our know, parents don't talk about that. No, no. I mean, I, I, I had to learn about Bates, uh in my adult life, you know, and I, I've had to navigate my own, um, you know, figuring out my identity that mm -hmm. now is when as an adult, I identify in the sense that I'm black and, you know, Hispanic, but I'm black first, you know, yeah. but then that becomes a contradiction because when people look at me, I'll get the same backlash. Oh, but you don't look Dominican. You don't yeah. look black. You don't, I can't identify black either. I can't, you mm -hmm. know, God forbid I even wear braids. So, you know, it's very complicated. It's very saying. complex. It's very but I, complex. But, I, but if I hear you, you know, I, what I'm hearing here is that from in, in Dominican Studies Institute, the Dominican Studies Associations, as organizations that you've all been founders in, in the ones that are building these spaces, that I think that um, there's a responsibility to make sure that these histories are being recorded so that we can, you know, and, and Professor Santana, Nelson Santana here, who's part of, you know, the educational system to develop curriculums and to make sure that we're documenting to educate our, our younger generations. And we have to really open up the, like, create like a forum with real discussion. We don't have to become impassioned about who is and who is not. Like the Puerto Rican said, que no tiene dinga, tiene mandinga. And we have it. We are, even the white Dominicans are the product of a black culture. Our music is not European. It comes from Africa. Let's celebrate that. At least let's start there. But no, right now, the coloring thing, the new term that's been out that's been put out there, is very alive and well. And it's, I don't know, 
people are saying, well, you know, she's light, he's light, this, but uh, how are you going to stretch this? How far are you going to take this? When there are black Dominican children being born every day, when there are black children around us all day, how could you exclude them? When I left San Pedro Macorís, I left a community that really pushed education. Our parents and grandparents taught us about our culture. Like I know where all my grandparents came from and how they came to Dominican Republic through the oral history. But I run into Dominicans that are from my tribe and these Cocolos don't know anything about their own history. They have blended into this community of nothingness because all they know is to about baseball, uh, bailar salsa and bachata, and that's it, having a good time. But they cannot tell you anything about what it constitutes being a descendant of these migrant workers that came entre, to the Batellas of San Pedro de Macorís. They have no idea. They will use the term cocolo to it, but they have no idea. And that has been lost. We lose in our culture day by day. We just lost uh, Nadal. And uh, Nadal was a very uh, great symbol for San Pedro Macorís because he won, was one of the artists that really walked through San Pedro and kept pulling the kids to learn how to paint and do murals throughout the city. And I'm not a great gulogista because in, in between the, among the Macorizanos, the Cocolos, there was also a class division. And in my family, it was not elegant to be standing around looking at no guloja dancing in the street. Now, for my grandparents, that was crazy stuff. But that's part of what the culture that we brought with us from the other islands. And Nadal fomented that. And uh, he's now gone. And whenever I look around, I'm saying one less is gone. Like we just lost John Shepard that came from that tradition of elegance and dignity. He's gone. And people that we associated with that could really record the history of the Cocolo, the trajectory that we have followed throughout these years at disappearing. And uh, little documentation is done of that. I have tried to associate myself with groups of Macorís here, but everybody's off to their own little thing. But I'm hoping to continue to work with the Gaviites and see if we could bring in more of our people to learn who we are. We not only this term Cocolo that's negative to me, but we are Cocolos with so much to be proud about. We have brought so much. And uh, I value the island in which I was born. I, I cannot claim any other place. I'm from San Pedro. I'm from Dominican Republic. And mm -hmm. I would say the only time I really felt a accepted in the community or who give me the power to say I'm Dominican mm. was Juan Bosch mm. and Anthony. They, that man treated me with a respect that nobody had ever given to me. And for me, he is El Patriarca Dominicano. Mm. I will never forget his kindness mm. and how he treated me as a person. And all he saw was Ophelia. And mm -hmm. Ophelia, of, that's Ophelia. Let Ophelia speak. Ophelia have something to say. The first Dominican man to ever do that mm. for me. And I would tr I treasure that and I will take that to my grave. So that was a space in which I felt comfortable because he allowed me to be me and he will tell his followers, let her speak. Mm. And I spoke. Mm. And well, uh, I, um, I was, um, 
I was a little bit of a witness to that process that Ophelia just described, and I could add as an illustration that uh, uh, as part of uh, that um, attitude, he would also call Ophelia often uh, either La Diabla or E Diabla. And uh, uh, I think uh, he always met that as many Dominicans do as a compliment, uh, believe it or not, given, you know, considering what the devil means, but still, <laughs> um, uh, he, uh, he, would, he would use that term or that nickname uh, to refer to Ophelia's uh, immense amount of skills and dedication and wisdom and, and ability to solve problems and deal with people. And, um, you know, I can attest, uh, aside from that, to this uh, attitude of uh, uh, respect that Ophelia was, um, was referring to, that uh, coming from a person like uh, Juan Bosch is something that one would really treasure uh, any, anybody who met the, the man, right? And, he, and this, this was a, a Sibaeño, very light-skinned white man, you know, but a very, a very educated, a very, uh, what would be the word to describe that? A very sensitive, very wise person, somebody that had uh, long ago overcome prejudice, you know, and uh, treated people through uh, an approach of respect. Besides everything else that he was and he meant, uh, we're talking about these very interpersonal day-to-day -day dynamics. So I can I can attest to, to what Ophelia was was saying in terms of that experience. This 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 entire topic is so complex and so um, uh, rich in a way that uh, you know we could uh, uh, the the conversation could could go into a lot of long, lengthy, interesting though you know things. <laughs> uh, and uh, I I would I would still want to refer to two things that come to my mind that are just part of this entire issue of vivir juntos and convivencia and so on. One, one has to do with, uh, uh, briefly, with uh, what uh, mm, I would describe as part of our experience of exclusion. Um, a, a while ago, I was saying that it's hard to distinguish where the personal and the collective uh, end in this regard, because it's like, uh, how, how would they say nowadays? It's a continuum, okay, <laughs> of experiences. Um, ones are more close to your intimate life, others are more in terms of your social life. But um, if I'm to mention uh, one experience of uh, exclusion, um, it, in my mind, in my memory, it, it has to do more than with individual experiences, with collective experiences. Ophelia was mentioning this activism that was taking place in the Dominican community of Washington Heights, let's say in the, actually it began in the 70s or earlier, but I, I experienced it and witnessed it during the 80s and, and, and beyond. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the big experience, feelings of exclusion that was shared by many Dominicans, including myself, um, was what was going on in the school system that uh, uh, was a subject of a lot of uh, community fighting and struggle that had to do with the deficient quality of education that Dominican, most Dominican children were exposed to in public schools in Washington Heights, um, as well as uh, some levels of uh, more or less open discrimination about, uh, against the students and their parents for being Dominicans, for being the way they were, for bringing in the experiences they brought, um, which uh, when looked at the, at, uh, when looked at from, from through the lens of, let's say, the average mainstream New York, New York slash U.S. mentality, you know, sometimes judges us as people with uh, less uh, uh, education, 
with less, uh, uh, you know, I would say with less decency. It, it, the, the whole thing had to do with looking at us with, uh, as people with looking at us and oftentimes treating us as people with less dignity or mm -hmm. with less with less rights, people that were le less worthy, so to speak. So th those years in Washington Heights uh, had a lot to of a, a component of feeling of exclusion that mm -hmm. was associated to the overall situation of the Dominican community as it was being uh, experienced. Um, it, it had a lot to do with how the New York Police Department, you know, our blue heroes uh, treated Dominicans in general in that community, uh, a, a, a dynamic that, that, again, was influenced by a lot of uh, attitudes that, that uh, uh, daily Dominicans would complain about from those that were more or less clearly identified with unru unruly or illegal behavior all the way to uh, the people that were the most integrated, those that traditionally we call the most decent people, you know, that comply with every rule, blah, blah, blah. Um, there, there, there was a lot of tension in that regard as well. So uh, many Dominicans did not feel uh, respected by this public public uh, uh, employees body who uh, uh, police officers are paid by our taxes, okay? And um, there was a lot of tension because many Dominicans felt that individual police officers uh, did not treat them with the level of respect that uh, they would treat non-Dominicans. So living, as, uh, living within that community, as part of that community, identifying yourself as part of that community there, there was a lot of um, that tension that sooner or later would touch you personally because mm -hmm. uh, uh, it, it was not only uh, seeing it happening to other people, but every now and then, you know, uh, it might happen to you, especially if uh, you tried to behave with uh, whatever, you know, let's say with, with the fullest of your authenticity in front of police officers to the extent that, you know, if you were doing something and they would call uh, your attention, you know, they, they would, they would, they would call you, they, they would sort of uh, suggest that you might be doing something wrong. And then you felt entitled to engage in a dialogue or even a debate with a police officer that was, that was then getting into dangerous territory because you could end up being either threatened or mistreated. So the, the, the experience of exclusion that we can talk about or some of us talk about uh, is not only individual, it's also collective. Again, I, I couldn't tell you uh, where the line ended between the feeling of individual exclusion and uh, collective exclusion, though I would tell you that probably in those days, uh, in my case, it was more uh, digesting the the, the 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 vibrations of the collective exclusion because in my own intimate daily life I didn't experience it uh, that much or so I thought because that's another question when you are living through these kinds of prejudiced uh, loaded situations uh, I had friends that would warn me sometimes Andre. Uh, you are being discriminated and either you don't realize or you don't want to think about it or you don't want to accept it. Actually, I felt in my case, I was just too busy thinking about things and doing things that uh, so, so as to maybe spend too much time, you know, gauging or measuring whether I was being discriminated or not. But uh, that, that, that's one aspect. Another aspect I wanted to refer to uh, is something that I would call, I don't know if that's the right word, but now that we're talking about this openly and freely, right? Um, what I, I, would, I would call as, uh, uh, well, maybe, maybe it's not so strange uh, compared to what I was saying before, but I would call it some kind of vicarious feeling of exclusion. That is to say, how you feel when you see other people suffering exclusion that you still feel somehow 
uh, identified with as human beings or as member of the same community you reside, the same place you reside at, or the same ethnic community that you feel you belong to, or where you where you expect that you would be accepted normally, right? And uh, this this particular case has to do with uh, uh, what has happened to uh, Dominicans in the Dominican Republic, and we're talking about easily one quarter of a million people, okay? Dominicans inside the Dominican Republic who happen to be descendants of Haitian immigrants. We're talking about, again, about a quarter of a million people, uh, fourth, fifth generation of immigrant Haitian workers that either came on their own or for the most part, and so far as I know, were actually brought enticed to come to the Dominican Republic to work, especially initially in the sugar industry and later on in other areas of the Dominican economy. Um, as, as you know, uh, there's this big issue, uh, big, because it has been debated inside the Dominican Republic as well as outside the Dominican Republic, that has to do with how in 2013, uh, the Dominican uh, uh, um, uh, Constitutional Tribunal decided, came up with a, a, a legal interpretation that said that basically any descent, any 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 person descendant of an a Haitian immigrant from 1929 onwards who could not prove that their parents or grandparents were admitted uh, with documents, so-called legally. Uh, still today, still being the member of the fourth or fifth generation, had inherited that uh, illegal status in the Dominican Republic, and therefore, no matter no matter the fact that they were born and raised all their lives in the Dominican Republic for several generations, okay, uh, that uh, they were no longer entitled to Dominican nationality and citizenship. To me, that was a huge issue, a huge experience in my life when that happened, because uh, basically, um, you know, those of us that are the children of Dominican migrants abroad, where, whatever place in the world you're talking about, because as you know, Dominicans are nowadays spread throughout half, half of the uh, planet, right? Uh, if not more. Um, so here you have the challenge that the, the, this situation where as uh, the child of a Dominican immigrant mother born in the United States, the US uh, legislation so far, because I don't want this to sound like I'm romanticizing what the United States is and its legislation and its constitution. Those of us that are more or less you know, informed, we know that as any other country in the world, there's a lot of bright things as well as a lot of shadowy, dark things, ugly things, offensive things uh, in, in US uh, history. So uh, let's, let's leave that aside clear you know, uh, from the start. But what I'm saying is uh, in, 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 a, in, in the US society, uh, a social um, consensus uh, or a, let's say a social status has been historically achieved where people that are born here are automatically granted uh, citizenship and all the rights that that entails. This decision in the Dominican Republic, you had uh, uh, a political elite, you know, in the Dominican Republic that all of a sudden decided that um, no matter the fact that people were born in the Dominican Republic, had lived their lives in the Dominican Republic, and especially, to, because to me, that's the main issue. No matter the fact that their ancestors for four or five generations had been contributing their sweat, their effort, and all other contributions that normal residents in the society do, their work, uh, that, that became uh, something meaningless all of a sudden. That is to say, um, we don't care what your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-grandfather did positive 
for this society that we are part of. We don't care about that. We just care about the fact that you cannot show me a document that says that that ancestor of yours uh, came in um, documented. Uh, they, they, they have the interpretation was when, when, when you could not show such a paper, that meant that all your ancestors, those four or five generations, had been legally in transit status for 75 years, okay, in Dominican society, and they were deprived of um, uh, the right uh, to Dominican nationality. Obviously, we're talking about Dominicans, I mean, Dominicans born in the Dominican Republic, children and descendants of Haitians. I am not talking about Haitian immigrants in the Dominican Republic, which are the people that have been coming much more recently, you know, either some with papers, some with, without papers. But what, what I wanted to say is that sometimes this reflection about vivir juntos, uh, being included, being excluded, uh, hits you in ways that are not necessarily what's happening directly to you. Because you see that the dilemma that this, the, the, that, that particular situation of Haitian, uh, uh, Dominicans of Haitian descent, or Dominican, whatever way you want to call them, uh, poses is that for those of us, thousands of children, tens of thousands, uh, even more, hundreds, <coughs> hundreds of thousands of children and grandchildren of Dominican migrants that have been born, especially here in the United States, because this is the largest migrant community, but everywhere else, you know, we, our experience is that of uh, enjoying rights uh, to nationality and citizenship since we are born. And, uh, you know, you could tell me uh, about the, the, the inequalities and uh, uh, defects that this society has, but uh, I think that having um, formally uh, and legally the right to citizenship implies a big difference uh, in people's lives. So that, I see that as one of the achievements of U.S. society. This, this, this mm -hmm. law that we still have, right? Because mm -hmm. as you know that some mm -hmm. right-wing Americans that would like to cancel that yesterday right. okay. mm -hmm. uh, because of their mentality vis-a-vis uh, mm -hmm. immigrants. So here you have that we, uh, America, the Dominican American people, uh, we have the right to citizenship. Uh, and then these other alter egos of us, uh, because it's like, a, I, I feel it's like looking at yourself collectively on a mirror. These are the people that represent our same experience in a place called the Dominican Republic where we come from uh, are denied that right. And again, it's not, it's, to me, it's beyond an issue of what the law says because laws are written by human beings uh, and laws, laws reflect decisions, political decisions. Uh, from one point, society decides that this is no longer going to be acceptable. So you, 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 you issue a law prohibiting it. Or if you think it needs correction uh, or correcting, you create a law to allow it, right? Uh, to kind of reinforce it. Um, so laws are the result of political will. And here you have um, a, 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 an elite or certain political segments, because it's not all Dominicans that think like that, and that has to be repeated forever because some people don't yes. either don't know it or don't want to see it. Okay, uh -huh. we have this Dominican elite that has this notion of exclusion uh, in terms of who 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 deserves uh -huh. to be included uh, uh, and, 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 and considered a Dominican. And then on top of this dilemma that we as children of immigrants here, we have rights to citizenship. And then we see our fellow Dominicans of Haitian descent that are being denied those rights in the Dominican Republic through some legal argumentation, some ways of interpreting uh, old laws and so on. Listen, again, to me, that's not a valid argument. I'm talking about human dignity, acknowledging the people's contributions. And that's above any law. So if the law has to be changed, or as some Dominicans have repeatedly said in regard to this issue, if the constitution 
the Dominican constitution needs to be changed so that this quarter of a million people finally enjoy the basic dignity, citizen dignity that they are entitled to as any person in the world, okay? Let's change the damn constitution because the constitution is a tool that we create. Mm -hmm. and, uh, finally, the, the, the other element of irony in this whole thing is that since like 20 years ago, some more liberal minded people in the Dominican Republic, we also have liberal uh, forward thinking people among Dominicans, though some people don't, you know, don't want to, to see that. Some liberal minded Dominicans decided that the children of Dominicans broad, uh, born abroad should be entitled to Dominican citizenship. Here, listen to this. So uh, Jose Francisco Peña Gomez, one of the main you know, Dominican leaders of the 20th century, he pushed that. Then in so far as I remember after him, uh, Leonel Fernandez uh, uh, also did some, some, some supporting and pushing of that idea. Uh, so there was this wing of the Dominican political elite that for a number of reasons, decided that the children and grandchildren and so on of Dominican migrants should be entitled to Dominican nationality through some more or less simple paperwork. So I think it's inscribed in the constitution of the, of the Dominican Republic nowadays. So here we are, those of us that are Dominicans, uh, children of Dominicans uh, abroad, we not only have the right in this case in the United States to US citizenship, which again uh, is, is also uh, bestowed to the children of any other immigrant group so far, right? Not only Dominicans, and which I consider uh, definitely a social achievement of US, of the, Amer the, the American people, the American society, that should be an example for the rest of the world, okay? So we enjoy that status. The, the children of Dominican immigrants in the United States. Then on top of that, Dominican society or progressive Dominicans managed to get us a right to Dominican nationality, even when we are born abroad. There's this sense that Dominicanness should be kind of transmitted transgenerationally and uh, 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 detached from territorial uh, concerns. So no matter where you where you are born, where you were raised, uh, you know. I guess I guess by implication, though it's not being reasoned explicitly, you know. Nowadays, if 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 you if we were to be born in the on the moon, for instance, yes. which is an outside territory, we would still be entitled to Dominican mm -hmm. nationality there, right? That's that's the way I kind of see it. Mm -hmm. And then, and then even when you have that kind of plethora of access to Dominican nationality, either uh, from the Dominican Republic or, um, I mean, a, a plethora of access to, to citizenship from the Dominican Republic and from the United States. So we have this kind of double access to citizens' dignity, right? Provided to us by the US society and provided to us by the Dominican society, the Dominican state. When, in contrast to that, here we have an entire segment of the Dominican population living there for generations, being born there, raised there, with no experience of migrating anywhere. That is to say, they don't know Haiti, they don't know any place else besides the Dominican territory and they are being denied the right to citizenship. To me, that whole experience was in a way a life kind of changing experience. Um, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to assess that, but my, my view of the world changed forever once that happened. And therefore my sense of definition of Dominicanness, but not also Dominicanness, uh, belonging to an ethnicity that it, it forced me, it pushed me to reflect on 
much more universal aspects of this whole conversation that we are having so that you know after reflecting and being worried and and upset about this whole thing you know i have ended up with the notion that uh, 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 any human being nowadays no matter where he or she goes where he or she is born and so on and so forth should be entitled to citizenship as as a concept of human dignity mm -hmm. it should be a human mm -hmm. right you know yeah. uh, listed there on on the official listing so that yeah. no matter if you are chinese and you yeah. go to japan or you're russian and you come to the states there should be an umbrella of dignity throughout the world that covers all of us. So uh, as you see, this issue of inclusion, exclusion, and the way we live it mm -hmm. has all these dimensions. And for me, it's been personal, mm -hmm. it's been community, mm -hmm. it's been ethnic, it's mm -hmm. been international, and it, it's been simply human or global, if you want. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. a, a, it's an issue that, that won't be solved Going back to your question, and, mm -hmm. and we will not be mm -hmm. so unless we, all of us, participate more in the groups that are already organized to push for human rights and citizenship. Mm -hmm. And uh, where, where those groups do not exist, mm -hmm. we have to create them. That is to say, yeah. uh, it's a matter of struggling and then building, incorporating in our entire education system, as Ophelia was alluding to you know, incorporating everybody's histories into it. And I'm going to finish just saying that one of the struggles that, in my view, we still have ahead of us in our beloved American society, and also back in the Dominican Republic, is getting the education system to include the histories of all of us. Uh, mm -hmm. As you know, um, uh, the, 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 the New York City education system barely allows children of Dominican ancestry to access their history and that of their communities. And uh, even, even the, the most scandalous thing to me is that at the college level, in higher education systems, both private as well as public, like CUNY and SUNY, you have uh, an almost total lack of access, students in general, to study what Dominican society, its history and its culture is about. So to me, if you ask me at my 65, well, I'm 64, I'm about to become 65 at the end of the year, years of age, as a New York born Dominican American, to me, my sense of inclusion is uh, uh, dwarfed and uh, it's amputated uh, by the fact that after half a century of Dominicans like my mother and those that came before, residing in the United States, in New York City, contributing their sweat and their honesty and their dedication to, to work in this society, we as a collective are still denied the opportunity to learn about our history systematically in either the City University of New York or the State University of New York, where altogether you have probably somewhere around 40 or 50,000 students of Dominican ancestry. And that has been happening for decades. So I'm talking 50,000 now, but the exclusion has affected all those that have come, come before them. And then you also, it's also a way of uh, uh, denying access to Dominican history to all those other non-Dominicans that might have an interest in learning about Dominicans. So to me, and with this I conclude, the experience, the dilemma between inclusion and exclusion becomes very personal, but at the same time, very political when uh, I still have to witness this, this situation that in a, in a way I understand how it works politically, but morally and uh, um, sometimes also emotionally, it's so offensive. So while American society is providing me uh, uh, now, for instance, access to retirement as, as a former employee, as part of my citizens' rights, I have, to, I have to still deal with this very concrete way of exclusion that has affected me when I was a student in CUNY and continues to affect thousands of Dominican-American students 
that cannot have access to Dominican, uh, I mean academic access, to learning about Dominican society and Dominican culture because the people that control the political system that oversees the universities and the people that lead the university system uh, and the people that lead the, the colleges, especially the departments, have never had an interest in Dominican culture or history as to acknowledge it as a matter of teaching. And whenever there has been a little attempt of trying to push for the creation of such a, um, uh, element like academic departments that would teach Dominican uh, culture and history, there's always a resistance and a question, and there's never enough resources, always a justification. So this is to me what exclusion versus inclusion means today most immediately to me. The fact that mm -hmm. and young Dominicans and Dominican children are not mm -hmm. given by New York City nor New York State mm -hmm. the opportunity to access their culture. And as Ophelia was saying, when you mm -hmm. don't create elements to tools to help young people connect and learn and understand their historical background, you're condemning them, condemning them to live a life where they don't know who, the, who they are and, and, and maybe they will live with a sense of self-dignity a little bit weak or questionable because you are bombarded all the time by a society that questions who you are. And if you don't have a clear and strong sense of the dignity that you have as an individual who is a member of a larger community with a history and a culture, you might be uh, in your way to some heavy duty suffering, even when you don't say it, okay? And with Absolutely. that- Absolutely. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, both uh, um, Anthony, as you mentioned, and Ophelia. I mean, this conversation is deep. Uh, we can go on forever. I think you know my take from this uh, conversation, con esta conversación de cómo viviremos juntos, is that it does center around individual identity, but also it's not just about the individual. It's about the collective experience. Yes potentially impacts us. So that thus, como viviremos juntos, has to do with, yes, we have to have that presence of mind of constant, constantly asking ourselves because we don't live in silo by ourselves. Yeah. Anthony, you refer to, you could be in the moon, but you know, there, there's some contradictions about deciding who gets included and who does not get included no matter where we are at. Thank you.